Hey everybody, thank you for joining me for another tier list. Today we're going to be going through the studio discography of The Velvet Underground, a band that was a truly unique contributor to late 60s and early 70s music, and a group whose writing was very fearless, and they had dabbled into so many different stylistic territories, and they really were some of the earliest pioneers to multiple different genres of music that would become more and more prevalent in the coming years. And while their discography is not super large, I do think that each album offers a ton of different palettes of sounds and styles that can really appeal to many different types of music listeners. And when we're talking bands to come out of the 60s, I think they will always be considered a key contributor that wrote some very memorable and innovative music of that time. So what I'm going to do today is go through their five studio albums, starting with The Velvet Underground and Nico, and going up to Squeeze, and I will score each of them on this tier list, with S being the highest and D being the lowest, and I'll talk a little bit about each album, let you know my thoughts, and we will see where we end up. And please feel free to let me know your thoughts in the comments, where you agree and disagree, and how you would rank these five albums. I would love to hear your thoughts. All right, I think that's about it. Let's jump right into it. Okay, starting out, we have their debut studio album from 1967 titled The Velvet Underground and Nico. And I will give this one an S. Probably not a huge surprise to anybody. This is an absolutely incredible debut album. And it was seriously ahead of its time for 1967, really pushing the envelope and entering a lot of uncharted territories from a stylistic standpoint with a couple of more conventional pop and rock tracks mixed in with these psychedelic, experimental, rock flavors as well as some avant pop and proto punk and just in general I would say this is very daring and ambitious music to be writing in 1967 in this initial Velvet Underground lineup we have Lou Reed, John Cale Sterling Morrison and Maureen Tucker and this is also the one and only Velvet Underground record to feature German vocalist Nico on a few tracks which was done at the suggestion of Andy Warhol who also produced this record alongside Tom Wilson and I personally Personally, really like what Nico adds to this record. I think the timbre of her voice complements Lou Reed's voice very nicely, and it adds just another additional layer of sweetness to some of these songs. The album is 11 tracks long, with six on side one and five on side two. And I think side one is absolutely incredible from front to back. Sunday Morning is the perfect opener, more in the pop rock, art pop sort of realm, and just a song that has a really sweet quality to it and is a great track for really bringing the listener in. Then the remainder of side one gives us a mixture of a couple of more rock tracks with I'm Waiting for the Man and Run Run Run. And then we have two vocal tracks from Nico with Femme Fatale and All Tomorrow's Parties, which creates some really beautiful contrasting textures. Femme Fatale would be my favorite Nico vocal track from this record. I think that song is absolutely beautiful. And in between these tracks, we have the very awesome Venus in Furs, which would definitely be the most experimental and psychedelic track from side one. And one of my personal favorites from this album, I think that song has such a unique sound to it, and it does a great job of introducing the listener to the more experimental sides of the Velvet Underground. Side two then has five more tracks, opening up with Heroin, which is an over seven minute commentary on drug addiction and drug abuse, an intense song that really takes its time and builds up and gradually increases the noises and the psychedelic elements and textures as the song goes on. An awesome and powerful way to open up side two and also showing you that this group is not afraid to tackle all sorts of different subject matters in their lyrics. And then that is followed by more of a rock track with There She Goes Again. And then we have the final vocal feature from Nico on I'll Be Your Mirror. A mellow stripped down track with some very pretty qualities to it. And I really enjoy all three of the tracks that Nico is featured on on this record. Like I said, I do love the sound that she adds to this album, and it is an element that I do miss on their future albums. Then after that, the album concludes with two more tracks that really unleash the full scope of their noisy, experimental, and psychedelic flavors with The Black Angel's Death Song and European Sun, which is more in that noise rock realm and gives us more of a precursor to what we are going to hear more of on their next record. And you can definitely listen to a song like this and see how it would go on and influence bands like Sonic Youth and 
all of the early punk bands to come out of the 70s. And naturally, some of these more experimental and noisy songs are not going to resonate with everybody. And sometimes I do need to be in a particular mood to listen to some tracks like this. But I think in the context of this album, they do a great job giving us a lot of different palettes to choose from, whether it be the more poppy and art pop sort of side to their writing, or the more rock tracks, or the more psychedelic, experimental, and noisy tracks, which were really wild to be coming out of 1967. And I think this album is incredible, not only from a songwriting perspective, but also when you look and see how many different bands and how many different styles of music were derived from this record. I think it's pretty hard to deny that this is one of the most influential albums to come out of the later half of the 60s. And when we're talking Velvet Underground's full discography, this one would definitely go down as my number one favorite record of theirs. I know it's a super cliche choice, but I think it's pretty hard to argue otherwise. So an amazing debut album whose influence just cannot be overstated. This one gets an easy S. Okay, next we have their second studio album from 1968 titled White Light, White Heat. And I will give this a B. I have a lot of conflicting thoughts about this album because I can certainly appreciate it for what it is. And it's also undeniable that this album was a pioneer for the styles of noise rock, experimental rock, and punk. So I can certainly appreciate this record in terms of how influential it was. But for me as a listener, I would say that I don't always tend to resonate as much with this side of the Velvet Underground sound that we hear on this record. There are definitely a couple of tracks on here that I do need to be in a particular mood to listen to. And I wouldn't say all of the songs on here carry the same sort of replay value that we got on Velvet Underground and Nico. But regardless of that, there are still a couple of songs that I do find very enjoyable. It's only six tracks long with four songs on side one and two on side two. I love the way the album opens up with the title track, White Light, White Heat. Just an awesome feel-good rock track that would probably be my favorite song from this album. And great production from Tom Wilson, really getting such a massive and full sound out of this group. And I also enjoy Lady Godiva's Operation, which is another nice noisy track with some psychedelic layers on top of it. And I also really enjoy the closing track of Side One, Here She Comes Now. A tasteful blend of sort of folk rock and psychedelic and a great choice to wrap up side one. And those three tracks for me would be the high point of this record. The other three are the songs that I do find a bit challenging to get through. And like I said, I do need to be in a very particular mood to listen to The Gift, I Heard Her Call My Name, and Sister Ray, which is an over 17 minute long track that closes up the album. And in my opinion, I do think this track drags on for a bit too long. I know some people love this track and are going to disagree with that. But for me, I do find that some of these longer and noisier and more experimental mental tracks do make this record a bit more challenging to get through. Whereas with the previous album, I thought it was just one incredible song after another, and it didn't really have any moments that felt like a challenging listen, with the possible exception of the closing track. But I do find the challenging elements are more present on this record than they were on Velvet Underground and Nico. But in the midst of that, it does have a couple of songs that I find very enjoyable. And like I said, this album was clearly ahead of its time and was a very important record that would be hugely influential to multiple different genres of music that would emerge in the coming years. So I would say a very influential album, but not one of my personal favorites of their discography. So I will give this one a B. Okay, next we have their third studio album from 1969, which is a self-titled album, The Velvet Underground, and I will give this one an A. I really enjoy this album. I do think it is an improvement upon White Light, White Heat, but at the same time, I wouldn't say that it reaches the same highs that The Velvet Underground and Nico had reached. This was their first album to not feature John Cale, who was replaced by by newly added member Doug Yule. Stylistically, this one is also much different from White Light, White Heat, not containing those same noise rock and experimental elements, and instead being more in that pop rock and folk realm, with the occasional deviation on a track or two going into some more uncharted territories. The album is 10 tracks long with five songs on each side, and side one opens up beautifully with Candy Says, a really pretty pop ballad, and the first track to feature Doug Yule on lead vocals, which I think he does does an amazing job with. Then side one continues with a couple more rock tracks with What Goes On and Some Kind of Love. And then that is followed up with the two more folky tracks with Pale Blue Eyes and Jesus. My personal two favorite songs from side one would be Pale Blue Eyes and Candy Says. 
Then side two, I think, is really spectacular from front to back. I know some people don't always resonate with every song on this side, but for me as a music listener, I have always loved all five of these tracks. It starts out with a nice feel-good rock track beginning to see the light, and then we veer off into another pop sort of ballad with I'm Set Free, and then That's the Story of My Life is a more upbeat, feel-good poppy track that I think has some really beautiful melodies. And then after that, it takes a complete detour into the murder mystery. And this is probably going to be the most shocking thing that I will say in the entire video, probably my big hot take. But believe it or not, this is actually my favorite Velvet Underground song. I remember very vividly the first time I heard this song. I was going for a hike and I had my headphones on. I was listening to this album. And when that song came on, it just completely blew my mind. I had to listen to it over and over again, listening to the left side of the headphone and then the right side it's just such a uniquely bizarre song that is such a trip to listen to and not only is the concept of the song very interesting but musically i love the guitar parts and the organ sounds add some really nice layers of psychedelic to this already wild track and then the way the song wraps up with the piano loop and the vocals and reversed sounds it's just such a cool and adventurous song that i absolutely love i don't know if i've ever heard anybody else say that this is their favorite Velvet Underground song, but I just think this is one of the coolest songs to come out of the late 60s. And I also absolutely love the closing track, After Hours. That would be my second favorite song on this album. And this is just a very pretty acoustic song with Maureen Tucker on vocals. I love her vocal addition to this record. I wouldn't have minded if they utilized her a little more throughout this album because it would have almost made it similar to Velvet Underground and Nico, but with Maureen Tucker instead, because I think her voice went really well with this lineup of the group. And in general, I would say about 85 to 90% of this album is great. It's got a track or two on side one that I'm not crazy about, but all in all, I think it's got a very solid selection of pop tracks, a couple of great ballads, and the very unique Murder Mystery, which, like I said, I think is the coolest track of the entire Velvet Underground discography, but I am sure that I am in the minority with that opinion. But yeah, a great album. I wouldn't say it reaches the same highs as the first release, but I do think it is a solid step up from White Light, White Heat, so I will give this one an A. Okay, next we have their fourth studio album from 1970 titled Loaded, and I will also give this one an A. Another very strong album. I would say I like The Velvet Underground slightly more than this one, but this one definitely does give it a run for its money. This goes into more of a rock and pop direction, but is also slightly heavier than the previous record, with some of those proto-punk elements being present on certain tracks, and they were deliberately trying to write stuff that would be more radio-friendly. The album is 10 tracks long with five songs on each side and I do think side one is a bit stronger than side two. I would say it's almost perfect from front to back. Opening up with the beautiful and poppy Who Loves the Sun, which would be my favorite song from this record, a perfect opener. And then that is followed with two back-to-back -back Velvet Underground classics with Sweet Jane and Rock and Roll. A very strong opening three tracks of the album. And the intro to Sweet Jane is one of my favorite musical moments of any Velvet Underground track. It has such a magical sound to it and is such a cool stylistic choice to open up the track with before it veers off into that more groovy and rocky sort of vibe. And then track four is Cool It Down, which is one of a couple of songs on here that I'm not super crazy about and is ultimately why I put it in A tier instead of S and why I do prefer the previous record slightly more to this one. But obviously it does go without saying that this album does have its share of very exceptional tracks. But I do really enjoy the closer on side one titled New Age, which almost has this cool George Harrison sort of vibe going on. Then side two continues with five more tracks with a couple that I enjoy and a couple that I could do without. I've never been a huge fan of Lonesome Cowboy and Train Round the Bend. Nothing about either of those songs really engages me, but Hand Held High I think is a nice energetic and catchy rock song that opens up side two very nicely. And I Found a Reason is a beautiful ballad with really tasteful vocal layers. And Oh Sweet Nothing is a very strong closing track that really takes its time and builds beautifully and wraps things up on a nice peaceful sort of note. So all in all, I think this album is incredibly strong. It does have three tracks I'm not crazy about, but the good songs on here are really amazing and stand out. And there's definitely a handful of certified Velvet Underground classics all throughout this record, in addition to some very solid B-sides. So another very good album. I will give this one an A. 
Okay, and lastly, we have their fifth and final studio album from 1973 titled Squeeze. A lot of people don't even count this as a Velvet Underground record because it's almost entirely written and recorded by Doug Ewell. And I think it really should have just been released as a Doug Ewell solo album, but it did end up going under the Velvet Underground name. So because of that, I am including this as part of the discography. But unfortunately, I'm going to give this one a D. I think this album is really weak, and not just because it doesn't sound like the Velvet Underground, but also just objectively as an album. I find the majority of the songs on here to be very bland and boring. Not a lot of stuff that really engages me and keeps my attention. A lot of these songs just sound to me like very generic 70s rock songs without much depth to them. It's 11 tracks long with 6 on side 1 and 5 on side 2. And side 1 only has one track that I find enjoyable, which is track 2 titled Crash. That one's a short little piano and vocal track that gives me some you know Beatles Abbey Road type of vibes and a cool use of panning between the right and left speakers in the piano part. Uh, to me it's the only song on side one that has some sort of personality to it and has some elements of surprise whereas all of the other five tracks to me sound just like very generic and boring rock tracks. And for side two I would say it is slightly better than side one. I do enjoy two of the five songs on side two. I think Friends is a really beautiful song and to me that's a track that sounds like it could have been on their third album the Velvet Underground. And I also think the closing track, Louise, is a solid song. Nice energy to it, and it concludes the album, you know, on a good feel. But She'll Make You Cry, Send No Letter, and Jack and Jane just do nothing for me. And other than Crash, Friends, and Louise, this album has eight songs that I would view as complete skip-overs. So although it has a couple of tracks that I like, I do think the majority of this album is just so underwhelming that I couldn't justify putting it in anywhere but D tier. So if we're counting this as part of the Velvet Underground discography, I would say this is by far their weakest record, so this one will get a D. All right, we did it. We went through their five studio albums, and this is what I came up with. This was a very interesting group to go back and revisit because they weren't around for a very long period of time and only released a handful of records. But within that small span of time, they really pioneered so many different styles of music. And because of that, they have been influential to so many pivotal groups of the last 50 years. And their impact and contributions to late 60s and early 70s rock cannot be overstated. So that is it for today. Thank Thank you so much for watching. I hope it was enjoyable. And if you are interested, please feel free to check out some of my other tier lists, which will be linked in the comments and the description and see if there's anything else that you might like. And like I said, please feel free to let me know your thoughts in the comments where you agree and disagree and how you would rank these five albums. I would love to hear your thoughts. All right, that is it for today. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you at the next video. Take care.